Okay, it kind of feels like we're filming a TV show. I can't hear anything. I can't see anybody. I'm, I'm waiting for a director to say, do it again. incredibly proud to be releasing it. It opens tomorrow right here um, and then is going to be playing uh, throughout the country throughout June. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce the, the man of the hour, the fantastic director back on the canyon, Andrew Slater. Well, this is something. Uh, you know, if you're my age and you, you love the movies and you love going to the movies, uh, you know, when you're younger, you dream of going to see a movie in the Cinerama Dome. And if you're any age, I guess, and you make movies, you aspire to have your movie shown at the Cinerama Dome. So first, thank you all for helping me reach a newfound aspiration and having Echo in the Canyon here. Uh, you hear a lot of great stuff tonight that, uh, from a lot of great people. And, but one thing you won't hear, which I heard from the great Stephen Stills, who was sitting there, who, along with other people, will be playing music after the film. He was sitting over there, he said, you know, in 1969, I was sitting over there, and I was watching Stanley Kubrick's 2001, and Randy California of Spirit got up high on acid, and jump through that screen. <laughs> so if you're high on acid tonight, help a brother out. Do not jump through that screen. Anyway, thank you and enjoy it. Ladies and gentlemen, the director and writer, Andrew Slater. <laughs> Where do you want to be? I'll stand here. Uh, and uh, someone named Jacob Dillon. <laughs> the film is so great, it's the first time I've ever called you Andrew. You finally, uh, you made it to Andrew. Um, I'm going to ask you the same, I want to start with the same question. A year or two ago I was with Brian Wilson doing an interview about pet sounds at Capitol. And I said, Tell me what went so right, because this movie is, you, you set yourself an incredible task, so much so that when you told me about the movie, I think I might have passed on the opportunity to even help you with it, because I didn't know if it could be done, and you did it so beautifully. What, for both of you, what went so right with this film? Well, the writers of the songs, let's start with that. When that you, helps. If you're, making a, if you're making a film about the journey to California, the electrification of folk music, and what happened here in that brief period between 65 and 67 in that age of innocence. If the songs are there, that's the ten poles of your story. Jacob, for you. David, sit down. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm not a director. I don't deserve a director chair. Um, ask that again, please. What went so right from your point of view? How did this work out so well? Actually, I have no idea. We just started. Uh, we really didn't know exactly what we were getting into. But um, I guess with all the talent that we were chasing, something great was going to evolve. Something was going to expose itself. And we just kind of followed our nose. And the interviews kind of, um, they kind of told the story. We had an idea when we started, but the interviews that they told us, you know, that, that's what kind of dictated where the story was going to go. And what, talking about those interviews, one of them that, the movie being called having echo in the title I, I echo it back to when I first met you and the fact that Tom Petty is sort of your spirit guide from the very beginning of this movie is so meaningful to me because I think when we first met I discovered a lot of this music through Tom and I think the same might be true at least for you Jacob is that how important was Tom Petty to this film well, you know, we had obviously a lot of the players and the people who were there who experienced and lived there in the canyon, and then we had younger people from the next, or actually two generations later, like myself, but 
as it developed, it, it occurred to us it would be really great to have somebody who was a fan who was there. And it was great, who took that music and did something wonderful with it. And that wound up being, of course, Tom Petty. And, you know, I knew that about him as a fan growing up. I knew that he covered those songs. He played that Rickenbacker. He was, he wore the glasses. Yeah, Rick and what? It's Rickenbacker. <laughs> if you were if you were, if you were not paying attention. Yeah. It's Rickenbacker. Got it. You know, actually, I don't know what it is, <laughs> but I'm going to say whatever Tom said. Yes. Good policy. That works for me. Um, but, he, you know, I knew that. He was hugely influenced by that. And as we all know, the music that you find as a teenager, it's irreplaceable. You'll chase things, you'll be influenced by things, but nothing impacts you quite the same way like it does as a teenager. And this is the music that found Tom as a teenager. Uh, Andrew, I will say every time. Uh, I, you know, I've known you as a producer, a manager, a executive, but from my experience in documentaries, all of that can be not enough preparation for the challenges of making a movie like this. What, what did you learn from this process and how, how much is the film that you made the one that you imagined when you, whatever you were doing late at night watching Model Shop, uh, that you imagined that night? Well, the first thing I learned is that Documentary filmmaking is hard as shit. <laughs> and it takes perseverance. Uh, and I also learned how the documentary film community is so gracious. And there are people here, you know, uh, like we just want to say, you know, Morgan Neville, who, you know, gave his uh, advice, and Mark Monroe, and so. In the course of trying to do this, you know, you have an idea, and then you, you, you want to go chase that idea. And it, it, to your question, I thought the story was, let's look at the, the electrification of folk music, and let's look at the migration of people from New York to L.A. Because to me, I thought that uh, the folk scene in New York was very rigid, and maybe the electrification would not have happened there. You know, California has always represented a sense of freedom, that anything's possible. You know, you can chase your dreams here. Um, you know, even in, you know, expecting to fly, and, and which is which frames the film. You know, it in that period. You know, no matter how crazy your dreams were, people thought they would come true, even in that title. Um, and you know, what we find is that that kind of boundless optimism never lasts. And in the film, you sort of see that the bands break up. But but so we found that the story was really when everyone was here and when they were trading ideas and the sense of community, and that seemed to be more interesting to, to sort of pursue than something a little more studious about the, you know, folk music uh, migration. Well, one of the things that makes this movie, the challenge of it, that I can't believe how well you lived up to this challenge, was to take some of the greatest songs ever written, you know, great songs, artists like Stephen Stills, Roger McGuinn, these are some of the greatest ever, and then to have your leading man have to recreate them in duets with some amazing uh, other artists. That's a, Jacob, can you talk about the challenge of trying to, you know, if, to honor these records is one thing, to then cut them uh, and make your own wrecking crew. And these are some of the most exciting recordings I've heard in years. You're just, and you as a vocalist, I've always been one of your most devoted fans. Even I was stunned by some of the the work was just phenomenal. But can you talk about how intimidating was it to cut tracks by some of these heroes of yours? Stop it some more. <laughs> Stop it. You're embarrassing me for all my friends. Don't well, do I'm just happy because when he told me about the movie, I think he was going to talk about Michael Moore being the leading sort of uh, host, and I think he did much better. Uh, well, sang much better. Really? That's how I find out. You wanted Michael Moore? You were second. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I mean, I think that, um, well, first of all, we stayed away from the song. There, we definitely tried a lot of songs that maybe I didn't sound great at. But that's, as an artist who I've always covered songs starting out, as a teenager, we covered songs. I, I always do that. You start out, you cover songs, that's how you learn how to play. But even when we did that 25, 30 years ago, there were songs that I couldn't sing or whoever I was working with, the singer can't sing. So you have to, you have to acknowledge that. Not everything is for everybody. So we tried to stay in the wheelhouse of what I might sound good at. Um, but these artists, they, all their songs are great, so it wasn't a problem. If you found a song that wasn't great, you just skip that, you go to the next one, because they're all great. But was it intimidating? I'm not sure exactly what you're asking me, David. Please. 
Well, you know, for, for for us, we didn't really want to make a tracing paper version of anything and just make a historical document. You know, we wanted to try to make something new out of something old. And one of the ideas that we had was to take the songs that were basically sung by groups of men and turn them into a dialogue between two people, a man and a woman. So when you hear you know, Jacob and, and Nora saying, never my love, that has the connotation of a conversation or expecting to fly, the end of that relationship, you see Regina and Jacob sort of, you know, having that, that dialogue about the end of a relationship. So in a sense, that was the thing that kind of made it new. And, and then we also did some crazy stuff like, just take some of the elements of the songs that you'd find in a bird song and we put it in a, in a Mamas and Papas song sonically. So kept us engaged. And can you talk about the musicians who brought a lot to this? Because I will say, like, you're doing tracks that also the Wrecking Crew was the original band, and yet they rose to the challenge as well. Well, we went to bars to find people. <laughs> now, uh, the guys who play on, on this record are incredibly talented and, and gifted in each of their roles. You know, you want to find a drummer who can play like Hal Blaine, but not cop every, you know, drum film. That's no small task. And Matt Tech, who's great. And, you know, Dan Rothschild, the bass player, is an incredible singer and incredible uh, bass player. And if you're looking for somebody to play 12-string like Roger, that is not easy. And uh, Jeff Perlman was just tremendous at, at, at you know, putting the solo together for Bells of Rimney. So I, I think, and, you know, and Fernando per Perdomo as a guitar player, just incredible. And Jordan Sun is, you know, playing all the string stuff, and there he is in his British suit. <laughs> and we're only doing this just to kind of, you know, get them ready. I mean, you know, it's just so they do this. So, you know, we'll continue waxing loquacious while the good stuff happens. And what did this project, uh, you have a long history together. Was it, uh, did it bring you closer together? Did it create strain over the course of the four year, was it four years of togetherness? Well, you know, it's not easy going in, it, with any relationship that goes on, I think it's not very easy, you know. And we had some, we, I don't know, it was a, there was a lot of touch and go. But to, luckily, we've known each other since 1987, and I would say when things weren't going very well, we knew we would eventually get to the place where they did. But, it, you know, as any filmmaker knows, it's a struggle with an editor or whoever you're working with, whoever your person is. Okay, go ahead, buddy. <laughs> I agree entirely. That was great. You said it perfect. And that was a lot of work. Well, because it was a new, it was a new dynamic, really. Because normally in our uh, nearly 30 years of working together, our roles are defined more traditionally as an artist and a manager. But this was his, you know, this was his vision that I was happy to go along with, and I was down for. And this is something he was very passionate about. So we had to kind of switch jobs a little bit, which was fun at times. <laughs> Supporting him. You know, going down the road and figuring it out, and you know, I was happy for him, and I, I believed in him, but still, I was like the guy kind of along for the ride the entire time. And making movies is not easy. I know that most people here, if you go to movies, or maybe some people here are part of movies, one way or another, I guess I kind of learned that it's not that easy. It takes a lot of work, a lot of time. A lot of patience. Since there's no script, and he couldn't read what we're gonna do, and we're just kind of doing it. And I'm like, no, 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 we, we really we got it over here and film this because it, you know, it mirrors what's happening in the film, model shop, and yeah, it was a lot of tough discussions, I'll tell you that. But uh, we're still here. Yeah. <laughs> Are you okay to take a few questions from the audience? Well, is that? Yeah, uh, sure. So please raise your hand, I'll try to call on a few Depending of on the question, but of course. <laughs> yes, well, I'll stop the question. Yes, right there. How can we get the soundtrack? How can we get the soundtrack is a question. Well, first I want to say that thanks to Thomas Shear and Dan Deal and Jason Riddell, uh, I we were able to make this movie and put out a soundtrack, and they were super supportive and putting it out, and so you'll find it on BMG, the great BMG. Other questions? I will ask one. Model Shop. How, 
maybe I don't know how I missed this. I collect lobby cards of '60s movies involving rock and roll, and I never knew Model Shop. So was this the shared revelation of seeing this? These how did it impact? Because I think as a director, the film has a little of that. I feel that look is being mirrored in in a very interesting way. Well, uh, the genesis for that is that we were sitting in my house, and I was in a period of transition after leaving Capitol. We will call that fired. Um, and, and Jacob had just done a record with the Wallflowers. It was the end of a cycle, and this movie came on, TCM. And I was looking at the film, and, and I saw, you know, the places that we all go to, with, you know, Sunset Plaza and, and the Farmer's Market, and I just saw it in a light that was completely different, and it was obviously, you know, Jacques Demi and his cinematographers you know, view of LA at that time, and it just inspired us to kind of go back and look at the city before Uber and Lyft and too much traffic, and, and anyway, it just that stuff, when the movie looked like, as I say in the film, the sound of the Beach Boys and Mamas and Papas, and so that's what started it. Also, the film, you know, to me, I don't know if I ever said this to you, but I, I, I saw the guy in the film, and he was kind of wandering around and, you know, searching for something to do, and I said, well, this is like me, you know? I, I, I don't know, anyway, I'm making a joke, sort of, but, so that was the sort of inspiration, just seeing L.A. in that way. I mean, I think in the New York Times, when the, when the movie came out, Vincent Canby wrote, the main character of the film was the streets of L.A., and that's how it struck me. Um, speaking about the streets, we're, we're positioned here, not only in one of the, or the greatest theater in the world, we're also walking distance to many of the remaining greatest sonic temples where two Jews like you could ever go. Um, and so, can you talk about- Three, I think that's three Jews. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, well, don't out me. Four, five, uh, six, eight, exactly. ten, I was passing, 12. but you had to blow it. Um, so, what did you get, because I have had the same experience of, like going with Brian Wilson to where he cut pet sounds, and I said, what do you remember? He goes, I remember my dad putting his hand through this wall, and it, it, all of a sudden it's real, and, uh, you got stuff out of Lou Adler and so many, the sort of sense memory of being, that sense of place, how important was that for you? Well, I, I mean, those buildings, I hope they're here in 10 years. And, you know, they're a single story, really. They're single story buildings on Sunset. And, you know, with real estate and what's going on, you know, down the street, you know, they may not be here in 10 years. Somebody may want to buy that block. but. You know, for me, the echo, uh, well, you know, the human voice gets character from the echo in, that you put around it. And in those rooms, each of those echo chambers, whether it's in Capitol or it's at Sunset or it's at Western, you know, they all have their own character. The rooms have their own character. And you know, that's the basis for our culture and everything, this pop music culture, and everything that we built here. So. I wanted to document those rooms the way I saw them, which is they're, I think they're beautiful, and we tried to shoot them in a way where you could sort of see them in a kind of romanticized way. Because, like you say, when I walked into Capitol to record, uh, I think, strings on the first Fiona album, it was the first time I was in Studio B, you know, it was very humbling, much like being here tonight uh, in the current role, to be honest. Um, and you tell me when you want to strike up the band, uh, but I'll keep going until we're... When they tell me they're ready, okay. we, um, we're, we're ready. Uh, Jacob, um, as a... Uh, Keep all the balls in the air, David. Exactly. <laughs> He's juggling. I'll earn my fee. Um, the uh, interrogation uh, is not your main gig, so I wondered, was, it, were, was there any moment where you were nervous about uh, doing a, a lowly job like I would normally do? talking to some of these people, or was it entirely, it, you come off, I've always thought your secret, your, your sense of humor is a well-kept secret, uh, uh, but you, you couldn't be more charming, but were you at all nervous at any of those interviews? Okay, well, well, I'm, yes, nervous, sure, because why wouldn't I be around those kinds of people, but unlike yourself, I'm, I don't have an editor, I don't need a scoop, I don't have to like <laughs> impress anybody, really. I was just really happy to be around these people and speak with them, but what I was hoping to really do was create a situation where they were happy to talk and feel comfortable, because I know what it feels like to be some of these people, 
it's really to revisit 50 years ago might I would think awfully annoying really I mean a lot of people don't want to think that far back or they've forgotten about it or they don't want to be there they don't want to be questioned anymore so I, I didn't want to badger anybody these people I know and people that I respect and that I really like and I was really glad they would come down and talk but I didn't want to bother them really so I just wanted them which was kind of exciting and cool too because that became kind of clear that they're writing the story of this documentary that we're starting. It kind of, their interviews, they're dictating where we're going. You talk to one person, he would tell you something pretty, or she would tell you something really amazing, and that would tell you where we're going to go next. So that's, you know, our, our questions were really, I wouldn't say simple, but we just kind of let them run. And that would tell us what to do next. Well, I have to say that even aging rock critic, as, like myself, there were things I was learning, like, uh, on different levels, like Michelle Phillips, I've she just made the whole Mamas and Papa story come alive, like, and she was feeling it, and your performance helped her feel it and feel the songs, and it's so magical. And I have been a fan of Stephen Stills forever. I never realized that Let It Rain was a a lift, and I uh, and I also you know David, was, this is like my first round of interviews. <laughs> really, you haven't got. We should, we should, you have my number. <laughs> I should have. How long have you been doing this? I've, I've fallen on. off. Uh, uh, any other questions from the audience that would, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. In those interviews, what was the thing that most surprised you that you didn't expect to hear? Uh, the question is, what was the most surprising thing you heard in the interview that you did not expect to hear? Well, you got it? When you got that. Okay, I got it. <laughs> well, like what you just discovered, which was, I did not know that Questions by Stephen Stills was inspired by Since You Asked. And I didn't know that Let It Rain, like you said, was inspired by Questions. So, you know, that, that kind of lineage, I mean, I knew that if I needed someone in Bells of Rimney, that's a story that we, you know, I think has been pretty well documented. So finding out those little tributaries and things where, where people were inspired by the things was, was certainly there. Those echoes. Uh, other questions? Yes, right there, ma'am. The question is about Andy's, Andrew's tremendous success as a director and executive and pro a producer. She didn't actually say executive. That wasn't that successful. Uh, but, the, uh, True. <laughs> uh, but what were the commonalities, what were the differences you've learned about those experiences? Well, making a record is very much like directing a film in that, you know, you, if you're a producer of a record and you bring a band into the studio and uh, you have a drummer, you have a bass player, you have a song, and you have to get a collective performance out of people, and then edit that, and hone that, and make it into a, a coherent, inspiring piece of music. And when, I, you know, when you're a director, uh, at least directing this film, you, you have you have people who are doing interviews, you have to capture what's going on, you have to make sure the energy is right, and then you have all those other things. The, the main thing that I learned, the difference is that, you know, when you make a song, it's easy. You got three and a half minutes, you gotta listen to it a bunch of times. Yeah, okay, it only takes three and a half minutes. I learned when you make a film, you gotta watch it. You gotta watch it for an hour and 20 minutes. And you gotta keep watching it. And you think, was that an elbow? Is that working? Is the narrative working? It is no small task. So much respect for filmmakers and documentary filmmakers, I say that. As a director, have you already thought about a potential sequel like Echo and Coldwater Canyon? Just keep going down <laughs> canyons. Uh, you got six or seven canyons you could do. I have a few ideas. I mean, you know, I'm sure anybody in this room that makes makes films or was involved, if you get the bug, and all of a sudden, like you can't really turn it off. You can't stop. So, you know, the idea of of making something is, you know, is really is really compelling, and I hope somebody believes enough to let me do it, because we all know we can make stuff, but people have to invest and believe in you, so we'll see if that happens. And uh, I see a question back there. Yes.
the question was the wrecking crew documentary there were you know years of publishing issues clearance issues did you face anything like that no i have him <laughs> makes a phone call we're good <laughs> there's the secret uh other questions i think maybe i've ignored over here Right there, there. Are there any interviews that you did that were shortened for the movie and you're going to include on the Blu-ray or did, uh, interviews you didn't use? The question is any interviews that were shortened or uh, that you'll use in a DVD or eventually? There's so much stuff when you make something. So yes, it's there. I don't know what we'll do with it, but I would imagine since we just finished this, we need a vacation, and then maybe we figure, figure that out. One other thing, the publishers, I, I made a joke about Jacob, but I really do want to say one thing. People were so generous to us. The people at Universal, Tom Rowland, uh, people at Apple, Jeff Jones, uh, Elliot Roberts, uh, people at Wixen. I mean, they, they, they knew what we were trying to do, but we weren't trying to sell a film or sell a product or sell a candy bar and we were just trying to honor the place that we love and the music that we love and the people that made it so they were really really great and Lou Adler as well I mean just so great to us and uh, um, because you were kind enough to have us at this first uh, screening here what can what would you like us to do to help spread the word I mean is this is there anything you would like to suggest sweet what are you talking about <laughs> No, I, I mean, look, you know, if you enjoy the film, you tell people, and that's 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 the way it goes. I, you know, I, just in the end, I think the film is is uh, from a period when there was a great sense of community, and there was a lot of kindness. You know, we didn't really focus on the political and social aspects of things, because we wanted to make something that just, you know, maybe takes you away from the vicissitudes of daily life or all the era of the takedown, you know, that we live in. So just to kind of go back to that time when it was simpler. So if you take anything from the film, it's just, you know, maybe take that sense of kindness and community and, and you know, faith. Uh, can you two talk about, uh, I was lucky to sit next to the greatest drummer in history for the greatest screening. Drummer. Uh, and he, I told him he stole the movie like he stole Hard Day's Night. Uh, but the British... And uh, help. Yes, exactly. The British uh, presence of Clapton and, and Ringo it adds a lot and or sort of takes you into the world. The fact that this was not just happening in this canyon, uh, it was happening, it made a global impact and it was connected. That echo was reverberating. Can you talk about their contributions to the film? Well, I mean, it's, you know, one of the main threads is that Roger sees A Hard Day's Night, he gets the Rickenbacker 12 string, he electrifies folk music, the first Birds record has many things, it has Bells of Rimney, George Harrison, hears Bells of Rimney, he writes If I Needed Someone, that goes on Rubber Soul, which Brian Wilson hears, and he writes Pet Sounds, and <laughs> Pet Sounds comes out, and the Beatles hear that, and they write Sgt. Pepper, so I think their contribution is, you know, is right there, and, uh, you know, the echo of what was happening here, you know, changed the course of the Beatles, if I can say so, with the guy in the room. <laughs> uh, any other questions before we... I don't know if we're any... If we're getting close. I think we're close. Are you guys close? Right, yep. wait, who would... Yeah. Okay. Really close. They say close. Yes. Well, last sort of a question compliment was in the area I was sitting where a lot of the people in the film were, every single person was talking about that this is a movie that was obviously made by people who know and love the music. And so in addition to being a nice piece of directorial accomplishment, it also just the passion for music comes through loud and clear. And that isn't always true. It, it, that doesn't always translate. So thank you for making a music movie that really honors the importance of music in our lives. Thank you. We didn't do it for money, as most documentary filmmakers know. But so <laughs> we did it because we love you know, the music. Great. Well, let's maybe play we should... some music. Yeah, let's yeah. yeah. That's now that's now you'll see something that you don't see every day. Yeah, exactly. That was the opening act. Thank you very much, and let's hear it for these two.
Okay, Los Angeles, thank you for sticking around. Sorry about the little bit of lag of time there, but it's not easy to uh, show a movie and then set up a, a stage, so. Hell yeah to the crew, who did that. Jade? Hello. Can I sing a song? Yes, please. Can I please have a little reverb on my vocal in the house? Thank you. out there we can't hear so much up here oh, we can. okay that's a start okay, that song as you probably noticed was not in the film this one is JD ready again
Okay. Okay, it kind of feels like we're filming a TV show. I can't hear anything, I can't see anybody. I'm, I'm waiting for a director to say do it again. Are we doing okay? Oh, who's that? Oh, sorry. Everybody, this is Cat Power. Would it be so awful if this band has turned up a little bit? Because we can't really hear much. Can you do that? I, I'm going to do that. Well, how about everything come up? Can you take wherever at? Frank, where are you? Can we just turn that up a little bit? Oh, that's, okay, that's better. <laughs> hey, Sean, thank you for coming all the way to Los Angeles. <laughs> Be Let's have Thank a song you. together. Ready?
Cat power, everybody. Cat, you, what happened? Okay, you guys, obviously you were here for the movie, so you saw a lot of amazing people in the film. And some of them were lucky, and we're lucky enough that some of them were local, some not so local, but this is the person that was in the film who's a great part of it, who was so kind to be around. Where is he? Stephen, are you here? Are you gonna come play with us? <laughs> Stephen, I got a question for you. Here he comes. Everybody. Here comes Mr. Stephen Stills, everybody. Ask him about questions that Italians know lies. <laughs> okay. Did he say that or did I hear that? <laughs> part of the show where we're just going to do whatever the hell Stephen wants to do. I have an idea. We did do a little bit of a run through, but still, it's whatever Stephen wants to do. I've been trying to fix the monitor problem from this afternoon all night. This afternoon? What about like the, la the last 25 yeah. years for me? All I did, did was drive in the car.
the Sills, everybody, please. Steven says, great movie, too. Thank you, Steven. Uh, am I right, or do we have another special guest? Uh, also needs no introduction, everybody. This is Roger McGuinn. Who can also do whatever the hell he wants to do, and we'll just do our best to follow along. How about Bells of Rumney? Yeah. Okay, could I get um, my monitor in this one? Um, I, was, I did sound check over here. Okay. <laughs> Hi. <laughs>
so much for Stephen and Roger for coming out this evening and playing with us. And some special guests who also came out to see the film and all of you. And we're going to play you guys one more song. Uh, this person was such a wonderful uh, attribute to this film and such a, well, as obviously you guys will know, he, he doesn't need any introduction. It would be, um, we'd be remiss to not notice him in this performance right here. So this is a song for Tom Petty who... Uh, has a big cast, cast a big presence over this film. 